Welcome everyone to the Ohio Arts Council's Ripe Gallery Programming Series for our current show, In Touch. This exhibition is curated by Megan Young, and today we are thrilled to present artist April D. Felipe. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to utilize that chat function to ask your questions, and we'll be sure to get to them at the end of the talk. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth, so if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thanks everyone and welcome April. Hi, thank you guys. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And as she just stated, my name is April Felipe and thanks everyone for coming. Okay. So I was born into a family of four in a small apartment in Queens, New York. The city was an amazing place to grow up, filled with a variety of characters, constant action and energy. Sometimes living in a small apartment also felt like that. Exploring underneath the bed, traveling into the depths of the coat closet, there, I would not only find solitude, but treasures of buttons, scraps of paper, and string that I would later transform into art. And so that first image was from Red Grooms, who was one of my very first influence in my art field. And this next image was is of my mom's kind of altar. But this idea of collecting and keeping these tiny things that are important to us. I was always interested in being creative and in my household, they were really supportive. Anything really that you wanted to do, as long as you kind of stuck with it. So at 13, I had an opportunity to uh, really make a life choice path, which was uh, applying for magnet high schools. One was focusing in biology and science, and the other was the fame school. Uh, which was called LaGuardia uh, High School for Music, Art, and Performing Arts. And I always laugh that my dad was like, uh, these are very different lanes, so you kind of have to choose now. So I always joke that at 13, I had to kind of make the decision that I was going to be an artist. I left the city to attend university at Alfred. Uh, Alfred is upstate in a very, very tiny village in New York. Um, it's kind of a one traffic light town. And it was kind of a big culture shock for me. The wonderful thing about Alfred was uh, in that smallness, you really connect it with your professors. And you also, their art program, you do not have to have a major. So it allowed me to explore working with professors from all different fields. And two of my most uh, impactful was my work with Ann Courier and Fred Sheeta. While I was at Alfred, I became interested in the role of an artist as a storyteller. This interest manifested itself through viewing works of puppetry and stop motion animation by artists such as John Svankmeyer and the Brothers Quay. I was inspired by the surrealist nature of these artists and their ability and freedom to transform ordinary objects and spaces. As my studies continued, I became more interested in the objects created for the animation than the act of animation itself. And these are some of the works that were produced there. While at Alfred, I became interested in the role of an artist as a storyteller. I became focused on working with porcelain, recording small stories from my everyday life. I loved working with clay because it forced me to slow down. I enjoyed the idea of linking the process of oral storytelling with my building process. Every time you know you retell a story, your perspective changes it. So I kind of thought of this as like the fired clay becomes the event and that the surface becomes your interpretation of the event at that time. And the fact that I utilized non-permanent surface treatments 
I thought about how the event will stay forever, but our interpretations can wear away over time. I continued this work uh, when I graduated and I moved back to New York and I found myself at Greenwich House Pottery where I had the wonderful opportunity of working with an artist who also was multidisciplinary um, named Peter Gorfain. He was a wonderful printmaker and ceramic sculptor. And I stayed in New York for about four years. It was really important time to make sure that you could make art when really no one cared <laughs> if you were making or not. So not for a grade, but for yourself and understanding the sacrifices that it takes in order to continue making outside of academia. And about four years of that, I felt really ready to challenge myself again. And that's when I decided to go into grad school. So I moved to, I applied, went through that lovely process, and I found myself here in Ohio. Uh, I was welcomed uh, to Ohio University as an MFA candidate. There, I worked with Brad Schweiger and Alex Hibbett as my core professors. One of the things I kind of, again, loved about this program was they supported you in following where your work is guiding you, not locking you in solely to the material you came to study. Because when I applied there, I joined their ceramics program. These pieces I created there were very similar to what I had been working on prior. Um, less kind of this focus on storytelling in this kind of like oral manner, more interested into in layering. I kind of discovered this reoccurring theme of this character of the mouth that you can see happening in here as a stand-in for a person always in this state of searching and wanting. I had created these little explorers, but I asked myself, what were they searching for? And I kind of decided that they were searching for a place to belong. And in this belonging, I had to ask myself, well, what does that mean for me? And how does one really identify what, what does it mean to find one's kind of place? I began to think about the construction and authenticity of history, both visual and personal. As a first generation American, my dad is from the Dominican Republic and my mom is from Puerto Rico. I question my authenticity and desire to claim the label of my parents' culture, knowing that I grew up in New York and I both do and do not belong to those worlds. By digitally appropriating the surface history from these images that were collected from homes on the, from the Dominican Republic online, and also from some of the forms of these ceramic women figures. These are like, um, you know, kind of like the tchotchkes that you would put into your house. And the form of them are specific in the sense that they're used as souvenirs in the Dominican Republic, but people do also keep them in their home. And the women are faceless because uh, of this idea of coming from the Caribbean. There is no one facial form to identify all women. So they remain faceless. So I collected these this surface history off of this image and created this piece. And for me, this piece was a real pinnacle point. It's not necessarily the best piece. Um, it's one of those painful pieces that you had to kind of make in order to get to this next level. And I think for me, it was the first time I was really honest in my work about um, talking about my wanting to connect to my cultural history and be seen within my own community. Um, I also start exploring the relationships of rooms. So in my earlier work, I always saw narratives being told either through the figure, the body, or in those abstracted uh, flat uh, wall pieces, which I considered rooms. So I wanted to kind of like really go back into depth of what, what I thought of these rooms, my understandings of rooms, but also utilizing rooms that reference kind of our childhood home this kind of original place of belonging. 
I start also thinking about memories and how they act as history, that they are constructed, they are shifted when they are recalled, and they are um, formed. They are reformed dependent on the needs of the person telling the narrative at that time. Um, I In the process of thinking of the childhood home, I had found those images were from this amazing, uh, actually, we'll just pop right back. Uh, this rooms that you see here in which I've, uh, they're from a colonial sampler, like a wallpaper sample book from the 70s. And they were kind of really a trip, but I was flattening out all of these objects that were in there so that I could kind of really think about what makes a space. And that led me into working in this installative manner. I really was drawn into this wallpaper because I love the idea of what is both a very apparent and seen, but through detailing is not seen. Uh, I also wanted to create a space that looked inviting to the viewer to to sit, but when you come closer, you see that the seat actually does not have a space for you. And here's a close up of that detailed wallpaper. So I'm digitally collaging, I'm lifting um, some of the original pattern off of that 70s colonial print. I love that idea too. This is a 1970s interpretation of colonial printing. So this reinterpreting of history or narrative based upon the time you're in. This paper, you see these searching women's faces. Um, these were created as well, kind of mimicking those mouths that were searching and looking for place. This is a singular drawing that I created based off of of to make that wallpaper and each of the hair design was pulled from my cultural backgrounds coming from the Caribbean we're a mixed race culture um so we have our heritage is a blend of um African uh European Spanish usually sometimes Portuguese and also the indigenous peoples of the island I start really getting into hair um I really loved, and this is a Victorian keepsake. And I love this idea that hair becomes this powerful, really powerful tool of how we record history off of our own body. Um, this is a hair scan that I did. And at, it's really in very tiny, you can't tell in this image, but at the end of those little hairs, I had um, used that in a print to mark family members that we had lost. So I really start wanting to understand how uh, we really kind of think about hair. So this is a drawing I created where I started thinking about these bundles of hair as information and lived history of the body. This was a family tree self-portrait. As I start kind of uh, exploring hair more, I actually begin to create uh, family trees. And so I start gathering family history and family trees from other, um, my own family and other people's families. So each combined hairball is a couple and then the hair coming off of it would be their children and so on. And so this idea that hair, uh, you know, links us when we have it on our own head, you know, as style, it lets us into different cultural groups uh, it affects the way we feel. It's a physical record of what we ingest in our body. And also this idea that it can, um, it can be used as a way of remembering. So that hair uh, research kind of brings us into uh, my MFA. And I had been recreating these rooms, these child references of childhood home, the imagined childhood home. I lived in an apartment. I didn't have these like crazy wallpapered rooms, but I enjoyed this idea of um, bringing people back to this uh, imagined collective space. And you can kind of see how these are 
tons of family trees that I had collected and this idea of this hoard of history up top and it slowly coming out. I also become interested in the, the stories that we take from our parents and how we kind of carry those through within our work. And I thought of it almost like this is stories of the mother and stories of the father. And it's almost like your medicine that takes you both to heal you or sometimes maybe you wish you didn't have to take it. <laughs> you could let go of some of that as well. So after my MFA, I had been doing these large scale installations and now I no longer have access, access to the printer, access to the time and space to create that work. And so I really find myself drawing again. Um, I was teaching outreach at the time, which I still participate in, um, teaching both children and adults. And I start thinking about the narrative of the ugly duckling. And I kind of love this tale because it perpetuates the ideas of visual belonging. You know, this idea of finding one's true place. But I always kind of think like what happens if the ugly duckling wasn't a swan and just wasn't a duck. So I kind of touched on this a bit earlier about like trying to find one's place. And for me, within your own community, and, and for me, because sometimes I don't fit the visual stereotypes from my culture, I can feel really unseen. And I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, and being honest in my work about that sense of loss when you feel unconnected to those um, you feel like you should be welcomed within. Also around this time, we find out my mother gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she was only 62 at the time. And so I end up like stop working and flying home to New York. And I spent time there with my sister navigating how we were gonna care for my mom. And I really start thinking a lot about, you know, I'm always interested in the stories, but now all of a sudden I'm also thinking about what happens when you no longer um, are the one who is carrying your own narrative and that you will no longer be the one who gets to distribute that and that it becomes our responsibility to hold on to my mom's narratives. So they're kind of, starts to, I start really thinking about who and how and why, uh, how we get to tell and who gets to tell. So there's, becomes like an underlying narrative of loss. Uh, this work, uh, I, as I'm starting to see that Clay has come back, I had an opportunity to actually teach at OS, Ohio State University. And it's there that I, got my hands back in the clay. And really, I don't know if it was just also like dealing with my mom and having this break from working that I decided, you know, as an artist, you have to make what you love. And I love working in clay. And so I came back to it. And this piece is really funny for me because um, La Lupe is a famous Latin singer. And my mom used to play her all the time. Uh, while we were cleaning or, you know, when you're young, it was like her jam in her 20s. So she really loved it. And I wanted to kind of solidify that narrative for her. Also, if you notice that there is a wonderful glittery nail up there, <laughs> that is because at this point, my my mom's memory is really starting to go. And we're really first starting to kind of experience that. And she had to go for an eye operation and um, she had Lasix uh, and she couldn't, because she was put under, she was really confused. And we were riding in the cab back home and she keeps touching the um, bandage on her eye and she can't remember like why she has this bandage on her eye. And, and it's really, it's just this really upsetting moment, you know, like it's our first time really seeing her disconnected and I'm getting very sad and, you know, and then all of a sudden I catch her 
um, looking at her nails in the car. And she goes, you know, the woman at the front desk said I had the prettiest nails that she ever did see. And I started laughing because the woman did say that. And my mom, God bless her, but she, she, was, she could take a compliment like a champ. And so I love the fact that like, she couldn't remember that she just had eye surgery, but she could remember that like, she wasn't going to let that compliment get by. And I felt like even in this time of loss, like there's still, she was still herself. And so really kind of working through these things through my work, but anyway, um, so I'm working on these small, bringing myself back into clay, working on these small narratives. Um, this piece is called, there used to be more space. I'm still playing with this duck character, um, really thinking about kind of how we place ourselves or where, how am I going to navigate both these narratives with my mom and desire to belong? And so I'm, I'm also looking at ball jointed dolls and re reinviting myself and reconnecting myself into clay in pulling through these narratives of the use of hair and the duck. This piece is called in, uh, Cleaning House. I started looking again, dealing with the personal, but also dealing with my um, issues with cultural identity and thinking about issues of colonialism that affect Caribbean culture. The title references a saying about wanting to whitewash your family, it um, cleaning up your house. And so that was kind of thought to be carried out in the Caribbean as marrying uh, marrying anyone who would let your family look more European. And so I really started thinking about, you know, how do people decide what parts of their history they're going to sever? And I really think about, um, I start bringing in this, in the background, you can see the little green prints, which are also visible in the piece that's in the In Touch show, which is playing around with the idea of the platano as a representation of my culture. Because the plantain is not only a large part of our food source, but it's also a nickname sometimes given to Dominicans, um, sometimes in love and sometimes not in, in a loving manner. But I'm starting to incorporate some of these items into this. And the text says, if you can't see it, because it is very small, it says, how can you lose what you did not know you had? You cannot clean all houses. And this idea of as many people are pushing that away, there are a lot of people who are researching and trying to reconnect to, the, to all of our history, the fullness of our history from the Caribbean. Um, this piece is, uh, you take it with you as you go. Um, this is asabeche and those little um, fists that that's an asabeche. It's like a warding, uh, a way of um, protecting yourself, like a good luck charm. I'm starting to incorporate the idea of utilizing fabrics. These are fabrics that I had printed. And so still kind of all going through that idea. I start uh, trying to find other patterns besides looking at wallpaper. And I come across these wonderful images of cement floor patterns from the Caribbean. These full tile mosaics are a perfect example of um, how I kind of think about how we tell stories, where we start and where we decide to end, changing what it might mean. So, in the Dominican Republic, in a lot of Caribbean place uh, cultures, they'll use hydraulic tiles. They're casted cement floors that mimic uh, ceramic tile flooring. And they're generally utilized to reference um, Spanish, Portuguese uh, history. So it was a way of, excuse me, a way of creating your home to Europeanize your home. But I love that if we actually studied the history of these patterns and tiles, it yes, it would lead us to Spain and Portugal, but then it would also move us more to Moroccan tiles and even deeper and further into our African histories. 
So I love this idea of depending on where you decide to stop looking at where these styles come from, really changes who and what you are embracing and what histories you're embracing. And so these tiles and some of these patterns start finding uh, and working their way into my pieces. This piece is, um, she was as lost to them as they were to her. And I, I'm using some hand-painted tiling, the platinum tiles uh, and the hair tiles. Also using real hair, this idea of kind of your cultural history, your lived history coming together. This is the seer. Each one was strange and each one was known. Pulling and letting. I love this piece. This is called, it's a really small piece. It's, it's almost like a pin, a brooch size. And it's called, I was told and now I tell. And if you can see that it has casted in porcelain, uh, the gold piece is this Puerto Rican princess. Uh, and this is actually cast it from a necklace that I received when I was 16 and kind of playing back into that, um, not feeling, uh, easily recognizable. I, uh, within my own culture, I remember when I got this necklace, I felt like it was like a passport. Like if anybody tried to deny me, like to say, oh, you don't look Puerto Rican or you're not really, or test me, I thought I would have this, uh. I would have this necklace as proof. <laughs> and so it's kind of that uh, thing where um, I really wanted that um, the ease of acceptance that I was not, that was not always the case for me. Um, this isn't So They Stood. And it's more developing this kind of like, when you start seeing these drips, I, I kind of think of these as like cultural histor historical histories coming together, blend it with the hair, which is the personal history. And I had been doing the ducks for a while and I started really thinking about whether, how much of the figure do I need to still have um, someone present within these collection of um, his narratives or this information. I had a wonderful opportunity. I had been working at a home studio for a really long time and wasn't really connected to academia or another institution. And sometimes that can make you feel lost. Um, I, I was still showing, but you don't really have that artist community to work. And so I had a wonderful opportunity to go to the Archie Brave Foundation in Montana. And it, I got to go there for about four months. And it really just allowed me to refocus and have these opportunities to bring uh, my ideas and explore scale. I was, you know, everything else I was firing in a very tiny kiln that I had access to. So I, I was allowed to kind of shift scale and start working larger. Um, and this is called cling. Um, this is another, uh, piece I'm looking at the time I'm, I'm starting to incorporate fibers. I had, I had been printing material and someone brought a really, I always laugh. If you ever receive advice that sometimes you have a visceral fe like feeling against, usually I'm like, it ends up being right. So I had been using some fabrics in my work, but they were printed. And I had someone tell me like, you should make your own fabric. And I was like, I do make my own fabric. You know, I got a little internally defensive. And then I had really started looking at this punch embroidery and um, which is the mat that the head is on and the hair is felt. So I'm starting to get interested in more fiber work. And it, as I found this punch embroidery, I loved it because it allowed me to draw in the fabric. And so I always laugh that that person who made the comment was absolutely right. This is Wade, this piece. Um, you know, one of the things that I started attracting me to the punch embroidery or rugging is 
all of those are tension held and all of the stitches are tension held and I loved just like again bringing it back to this like personal narrative or the story building each of these stitches um, are holding each other in line that's it I mean at the end of it I do glue it but prior anything can be pulled or unraveled um, they support each other just like you know, our own life is built upon the stories we keep. Oop. This is In the Flood, We Hope Not to Drown, which is another kind of expansion into this larger scale. Uh, this was around um, the big flood in Puerto Rico as well. And so I kept thinking of this being what happens when... Uh, I, I kind of thought about like being lost and these people and the hands are reaching out out of our own narratives, both sometimes they might be comforting, but they also could uh, be suffocating as well. So there was a couple of different things um, happening within these pieces. As we look at some of my newest work, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how I feel about collage. I've always kind of worked in a collaging manner. I love the idea of gathering and layering that in one piece, uh, you know, a pattern or a hair can be the focal point and then another piece, it can be pushed into the background. I really kind of always think of my relationship with working, um, not only what I produce for the viewer, but how I feel while creating. And I love to believe that those are one and the same, but I know that there are certain things for me as a maker that are just my own. And the manner, the detailed manner in which I work forces me again to slow down and to really take time to think through these events, sometimes personal, um, sometimes, you know, in the larger I mean, I do think politically is personal, but in the kind of more universal narrative versus your intimate narratives. I, you know, this past year we lost, uh, my mom passed and I had, looking back at work, I really think about like this double figure that was coming up of these watchers. And I think a lot about, I have a sister and the process of kind of going through um, going through that loss while you are mourning someone with Alzheimer's, you're mourning someone who is alive, but gone as it gets further on. And so that really kind of comes into play in my work as well. And in, in touch, we, oh, this, this piece is called, sorry. I really loved this piece because, um, it really was one of the ones that I really felt I was thinking through. My mom during the pandemic ended up uh, staying abroad. It just was safer for her to stay with family instead of living here in the States at a retirement home. And so during the whole pandemic, we didn't have access to our mom. And that was really a struggle. And so this work was kind of like, um, it's called Over Oceans her fear falls through me uh, because at the time my mom was having a, she was having a, like a, a, she was having delusions that we were in danger and just that disconnect or that stuff. So sometimes my work is really about, you know, kind of cultural placing, but it's still about work. Even when you want to reach out and be with loved ones that you, that you cannot be. Um, this is a small close-up of the work that is in In Touch. It was kind of wonderful to be able to create this large work that touched upon all of my research that I have been doing, working with wallpaper, the rugging, the ghosting, the ghost and the family narratives. And um, I just want to thank everybody for, if you have not had an opportunity to go look at it, you should. There is a lot of uh, information in that work 
um, and a lot of details to explore. Uh, this is my favorite quote um, from Murakami, and it just says, the memories are passed from parent to child. That's what the world is after all, an endless battle of contrasting memories. And I just want to thank you guys. This is also a color network. Sorry. It's an organization that helps artists of color working with clay receive visibility and opportunities. So I leave you with that. And thank you guys. I can. That's great. That's great. You can uh, have your work up. Be it, we can just chat either way. Oh, I stopped good. it. No, you're good. You're good. It's totally fine. Um, so now is the Q&A portion. So folks, yes. if you have questions, go ahead and pop them into, and I will uh, uh, give them to you, April. Um, we do have a couple of questions already. Yay. So uh, you work in porcelain quite a lot. What do you enjoy about working in that type of play? I think I have like a couple of things that I love about porcelain. Although, little secret here i have been trying to explore other clay bodies because porcelain is difficult to work in i think originally um i can be really cruel with my love for clay and the fact that i i am greedy like i just want it to do what i want it to do i'm not someone who is uh tied deeply to the like history of a material which sounds ridiculous after I talked about history but um I really like it because it's strong when it's small and a lot of my works are tiny and I think also um I like the idea that you're starting with a blank even though I know whiteness does not always equal blankness, mm -hmm. but I think visually for me, like it's a trained thing, like a blank piece of paper, a blank canvas. And I think like sometimes when there is tone already, then I feel like, oh, this is already, something has already occurred. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why I was drawn to it. And, and it's stability. It's, there is, when you're talking about desire to belong there is something about using beauty as a tool to invite people in. And I think that as a clay body, it does have this kind of lusciousness and importance that is like, it is not actually more important, but because of its, the way of working with it. And I guess, yeah, I guess actually because of its history, we kind of put it up on this, on this pedestal. But I also think it's because like, it's what tchotchkes are made out of. Like, my mom had the like precious moments and yadros and, you know, keeping it classy. And so I think like, like in your history of materials, it's in there. It's in that bank of like, what is of the home? And that's why I enjoy using, that's why I use porcelain. Nice. Um, Let's see. So you mentioned memories in childhood rooms. What do you most fondly remember from your childhood room? Oh my goodness. Well, I had to share a room. So I think like we live in like, I mean, our apartment wasn't that small, but like small when there's two people in one room, my poor sister, who's like opposite of me and like neat, organized, no clutter. And then I'm like, give me the clutter. I will collect every small little piece of paper. Um, I would say probably the windowsill. Cause mm -hmm. that's where like all your little, like I made this thing. Um, or like, you know, that one plant we couldn't grow, but never got rid of. And it just lived there with like one leaf on it for your whole childhood. And just like, uh, my, I mean, I feel like I was home a lot as a kid. And, uh, so it's just your world, you know, you create everything there. And, uh, yeah, that's what I, I guess the windowsill, because you could put like your little, your sure little altar. So, yeah. so you said something uh, early on that I think is really profound and not enough people give credence to is um, the, the, um, the challenge of working outside of an established structure. 
Like I loved that you talked about being in New York for four years and really dedicating yourself to the task of ensuring that you could do it outside of that structure. And so I was hoping that you might talk a little bit more about how, how did, because lots of folks will go through art school and not realize that once it's done, they have to keep it up themselves. Like that, that is not a realization. Well, right? and, and, so, yeah, and I, I always laugh. So whenever I teach, I tell people, I, I don't want to dissuade people if they feel passionate about going directly in school, but academia is not real life. It is its own life. It has its own reality, but that's not real. And I think, I don't know if it was like, uh, like when I left to go back to the city, I knew that you, it just, you have to know if you're going to pick this path, unless you are like naturally wealthy, which more power to you. Um, it costs a lot of money. There's a lot of sacrifices. Like, my vacations are usually dropping work off somewhere. Cool. You know, like I, you're going to maybe work multiple jobs and you don't, I don't even mean that to glorify like starving artists thing, but especially when you're younger and you're just have your BFA, if that, or you're just interested in arts and you didn't go to school, you, you have to figure out why you need to do this yourself. Like I know at this point in my career, like art, is more than just the prize of validation from others. It's something that I need to do in order to process my thoughts. And I'm lucky that people are interested <laughs> sometimes about seeing what comes from that or what I'm looking at or exploring. And I find a lot of times people rush through. I use like student teaching. I found this. This is kind of why I was like, it's important. I've known a lot of people who student teach go to school for teaching. And then when they do their student teaching, they realize I don't want to teach at all. I didn't like this at all. And I feel the same way about art. It's like you might love creating, but the lifestyle associated with it, you might not be into. And I think that can happen at multiple points in your life. And that's, there's no judgment on that. But if you're going to invest money from a grad program, which is expensive, even when they're free, they cost money then you should know that you want, that you need this. And I do think it's a wonderful experience. Like I think for me personally, grad school was a place where my work got pushed in a way that I would never have done on my own. I'm not good at asking for help when I don't know how to do something. Sometimes I would scale down to meet what I could do. And that was not acceptable. <laughs> You know, they're like, if you said it's a 13 foot print girl, you're going to figure out how to make a 13 foot print and build a wall and build a floor. And that I don't know would have come from myself and the support that academia can give you in order to create. Um, that being said, you also have to decide when you leave that what you want to do with that. And so that was what was so lovely about the in touch piece is like, I felt like I got to recreate or revisit a scale that I hadn't been able to do in a long time. And then kind of what that percolated from that is always amazing. Cause I kind of do think everything feeds into itself. And even for this talk, I know I bring you guys from like the very start <laughs> to the end, but it's when you work in collage, I kind of feel like that's what it is. It's like, how do I explain to you why there's hair on this? If I don't tell you how I looked at it, even if that's not the main focal point, you know, it's like, so as you build, I feel like you kind of have to like lay it out on the table. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I, um, if there was a, a educational gift, uh, beyond anything that could be given, it is that like, how can you do it outside of the structure? And I, I love how you speak about that and the importance of it. Um, the other bit that uh, I think was really and remains uh, profound to me is that you talk about your work as language, which I, I feel very passionately about the fact that uh, visual art is the other language. Mm -hmm. um, it crosses all cultures. Um, if you 
have context clues and, and all of that. And so could you talk a little bit about how uh, art has served as language, both your own art and art that you've been inspired or moved by um, and how that comes into life writ large? Yeah, I think that there's there's a couple of ways that that happens for me. I think um, I think earlier I'm a very talkative person and I can be a really um, very loud human being in a space. And so for me, work becomes my quiet language. That's my space to be um, reflective. And sometimes I worry when people meet me at my work, they're like, what? How do these things match? But it, it becomes that space for me. It becomes a softer voice for me to talk about things that maybe I don't get to talk about as myself as April the human, you know? And then I think I always thought that I was going to be a puppeteer when I was younger, like in all that stop motion animation. So I think I always was thinking about story in that sense, like talking verbally, <laughs> like this, that, that you are trying to communicate something and that art is a communicative thing. And so I don't think I ever separated that. No matter how much everything shifts, I'm still telling stories with bodies and rooms and spaces. Like since I was like four, 13 making little tiny things to now, I don't actually think much has changed. <laughs> like I'm like, up. Oh, I guess I'm just interested in the same things. But finding that voice, and I, and I also think like um, that it's okay to be personal and private that like you can decide what you give to your viewer and not, but that you give enough. Like I don't expect people, if they're not reading my artist statement, I have no expectation that you walk up to my work and are going to be able to didactically tell me exactly what I'm doing. But what I hope is that I give you space and the detail pulls you in to explore that you can have your own emotive response that are pull that are that is pulling you through and then that's how I'm connecting with my viewer and that I'm okay with that and that as artists and art makers or humans that we don't have to be one thing we are, we're allowed to have different values and different expectations on work and I think sometimes people can get really caught up in thinking that it has to be one way and it's like that's okay some work shouts some work whispers there, there's space for that. So, and I can't do anything else. So, you know, I'm kind of locked in, I think. <laughs> but that's kind of how I think of talking or communicating with your viewer. And I hope that um, kind of answered. So you also, actually, there's another question that I want to make sure I get to. You mentioned inspirations for your work. What is the rest of your ideation process? Do you sketch? Do you make paper collages to work through elements of your 3D work? How do you work through your trial and error? Yes. So I would say that oh God, we're in my studio. I wish I had something right on hand. But bam. Um, so what usually happens is some work starts with a sketch. Some does not. Some work, the plaques are the sketches, especially some of the smaller things. There is that moment of thinking and my titles, uh, they are kind of the seeds that plant. So sometimes I have a title like from my sketchbook. And then because I work in collage, I can sometimes have pieces already created. And that then it's like... Uh, the process of ceramics, I have to like create the thing, then I have to let it dry. So I'm creating something else. In that time process from the day that I made it to underglazing, I once fire. So a lot of the surface that is fired surface is on the piece when it get, goes in. I have to have that break. And then when I come back to it, it depends on what has happened since then, I might approach something with the same idea, but now as it's come out, it's asking something else. And sometimes then it goes away. I'm like, ugh. 
I don't want to deal with you right now. And it like leaves. And then sometimes it gets incorporated into other works. So for the smaller things, I feel like they are more of an intuitive. You're working through this idea. Um, I have built a practice. Uh, one of the best comments I ever had was like, if you work consistently, you can trust yourself. Mm. So a practice is just that. So I'm lucky right now that I have a space that I can work in pretty consistently. So when I make choices, I can kind of trust them. I have found when you're out of the studio for a long time, then you have to reevaluate. You're like, why am I using this? Am I using this just because I've always used it? Does it mean anything anymore? Like, what has this thing begun? And that's good. It's good to keep questioning. But sometimes I think the smaller things are these more intuitive kind of uh, moments. But there is a demand of time that the clay, and I do cold surfaces. So meaning like I paint on my pieces, I gouache, I draw. I don't believe in rules. They're like, now ceramics is really mixed media anyway. So it's not such a big deal. But I always laugh at people when I was like, but when I was... When I was when I was little and in the field, you have like you had a fight for that. That like I had a fight to use, you know, pencils on my work. I had a fight to use that. So I kind of felt really passionate about being like, there are no rules. Use whatever the whatever your work needs is what you do. Those are the rules. Your yeah. work makes the rules for you. I mean. There are some things you have to follow in ceramics because they'll be like, this is a hard fast. <laughs> but beyond that. So, so, but larger pieces I do draw. But even then, I think I never have such a hard casted vision. Like even the piece you see, my first iteration of it was the ghosts. And I was making this like bumpy. I was really interested in this bump happening and that it was like long, like a trail. And then I was like, I can make the table it like it's floating. Like that. So I think being open to letting as you're building, you're in that conversation with your work and you're going back and forth. And sometimes your vision like doesn't work for it anymore. Um, but yeah, so sketching, I wish I was drawing more. I'm really trying to get back. I bought like an iPad to try to sketch more. That's like a whole new learning. I keep incorporating things that I have to learn more learning no I'm just kidding learning is good so I've been trying to draw more because I do think the cell phone is really evil in the sense that it killed a lot of my journal time yeah because it's so there and easy but so um since we're on this track tell us about uh what a standard like do you have a, a studio practice that get or like uh ritual that comes into play when you enter, what's it, what's a day in the studio for you? So I would say my, so my studio is attached to my kitchen. So usually it's like, you know, get your breakfast on, come in, uh, look at emails. If I have email stuff to do, I am a super procrastinator. And so I need deadlines to get things done. Unfortunately, the downside of the way I work is like, oh, it could be any, you could do this forever. You could forever add. So I need like hard dates to be like, this needs to be done. You need to be satisfied around this point. <laughs> I'm not good at just like, I think things just never end if I don't have like an end. So I come in and, um, I kind of have like a little bit of an attention span issue. So it has to be what catches on that day. So some days I'm wet working. Um, some days I'll be like, oh, I'm really into this like fiber idea. So I'll, I'll want to do that. And other days are painting days. And then like the upside of being ADD is that you have hyper fixation. So like I can sit and paint for like nine, nine hours of drawing, you know, and be like, oh, what a good day. And like, and then like, and then the cat comes in my studio and then I might be lost for like three hours and then I'm back. So I wish it was like this, like more uh poetic kind of like, and the sun comes down, but like, it's usually like more chaotic. And, um, and then I don't find myself when I'm having a hard time connecting to my work. Um, I mentioned like I lost my mom last year. 
And I just didn't want to make any work. And so I basically like finished work, but you still have a career that you have to like do stuff for. So it was finishing stuff that I kind of had made that didn't feel bad about, but I didn't feel connected to. And so that was really hard because you're preventing yourself from doing the thing that actually makes you feel like yourself. Um, but that's what was needed. Not beating myself up over it. Craft sometimes can be really hard on productivity. Um, and if you don't feel productive enough, somehow you failed. And that's kind of a crock. I mean, it's both true. Like you do need to create, but by your own standard, not by other people's. And um, and that again goes through time, working for enough time. You know, I was telling someone like I've been working in clay for over twenty years. Like that's a long relationship to have with a with a thing. So, uh, that's kind of what it looks like. And then sometimes you get distracted and you have to do life things and you don't get your studio time in. But I try, I try to get get in and try to find opportunities that let me work outside of my home studio. So short-term residencies, if anybody's listening that does that stuff, I think are really important to surround yourself with other artists, even if it can be intimidating or just a free workshop or something, or because you find so much more out about your process by working with others. And also like, we can all get uptight about the own things we like take ourselves too seriously. And like, sometimes I like to be like, yes, you work in dirt. I work in fancy dirt, you know, and it's like, you need perspective on that as well. But yeah, it, that's, I like to ask that question because it humanizes the experience of being an artist for yeah. a lot of folks that are watching these um, because everyone is different. Yeah. There's, there is no one cookie cutter that makes it, you know, and you um, to dovetail and round us out completely. Um, you talked a little bit about this just now, but the importance of community. So you actually created a community to help um, give visibility and opportunity to folks of color. Can you talk a little bit more about the Color Network, how folks yeah. can get involved? Yeah, I'd love to create it. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for, I know I sped through that. I'm sorry. I forgot that slide was in there. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot I was going to do that. <laughs> so um, the namesake, the Color Network, actually comes from a group that started way before us. And and in around 29, a little bit. It was in Dayton, right? It was Bing Davis? Was it Bing yeah, Davis? I, yeah, uh, Bobby Shrogan's and uh, yeah. they were a collective of artists of African-American artists in, in clay, creating showing opportunities and community-based opportunities. And, um, and over time it had different iterations and, um, and people were utilizing it in different ways. And in 2017, uh, there was a wonderful, in SICA is our national ceramic education conference of America. We, I just came back from it, this one. And at one, there was a real uh, call and space for people wanting to work together. And a small group of us reached out and wanted to do something. And we reached out to Bobby Shrogans and asked if we could carry the namesake on. And that's what we have been trying to do. So uh, we have been, it's kind of been amazing and wonderful in that we have an online presence through our website, which is thecolornetwork.org. And um, opportunities for grants, uh, we distribute, um, sometimes we help distribute uh, scholarships and other events through organizations that are trying to expand the reach of their programming. We have, uh, we give out micro grants for artists of color working in clay that want to apply for shows because we know that sometimes with a show has two forty dollar three forty dollar application fees but we also one of the big things we do is we have started an online mentorship and mentee program and it's uh it is easy access meaning if you would like mentorship or if you want to be a mentor because we're always looking for mentors 
um, all you have to do is ask. It is it is first come, first serve as we have available. So some people are like, we've been on a mentee list for a long time, but we're hoping to acquire more mentors. Um, and But if you have a question or something, people can just reach out to us through email and we do try to help support. We've been able to do some shows. We got an NEA grant this year working with Watershed for a residency for uh our for our mentors and mentees to actually because it's all online we're all online sorry I should say that um but so that they can meet in real life and so that has been and that comes from working in a home studio we had I was working with a friend putting a show together for Latinx artists and we at the time we were really struggling to search beyond the people we just know. And that's kind of where that like, how we know people are out there making, why don't we know? And I do think that the world has been trying the art world to really trying to expand their reach and who they see and make space for that. And so over these past couple of years and in our field, I've noticed a huge difference and it is an enriching difference um, that we can hold on to what works and what makes things special and expand into, uh, you know, letting other people have access to that as well. So it's been really, it's been really a lot and, but great and pretty awesome. It is, it is great. So thank you so much for the work that you do for that. I think that's yeah, no problem. important. Um, so uh, folks working in clay that are of color, make sure that you get involved. Um, yeah, and our Instagram is the easiest way to kind of like DM us or whatever communicative way feels comfortable for you. And then for non-artists of color too, we have a database, which is really an awesome resource. Sorry, I always like to say this because sometimes people feel like, oh, well, maybe that's not <laughs> a space for me, yeah. which is fine. But um, one of the one of the other big feedbacks we get is from teachers, especially high school teachers as well, that are trying to connect their students with artists. Uh, and it, and it, you know, if we want teachers already do so much work, like how do we make things simpler? Yeah, yeah. it know? is an incredible resource to find phenomenal artists. You, yeah. You're doing a great service to the art world at large. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we have been really lucky to have support and it's been it's been phenomenal yeah well i think that that's the perfect place for us to leave off this has been absolutely a delight thank you so much for your time and talent april thank um you guys. joy to see your work in the the arc of it and it just keeps going up so i look forward to seeing how it grows beyond um Big thank you to Megan Young for curating this exhibition, to the other artists that are a part of it, of course, um, to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the governor and leg legislature who support the Ohio Arts C Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great day.